In this talk, I'll be describing about transportable acoustic sources and Siamese neural networks to classify fracture saturation. I'll first say something about seismic visibility of fractures. I'll describe a novel source that we're using for internal illumination of fractures and that, that we call chattering dust. And then I'll describe machine learning to discern saturation states of fractures. The basic problem is that we want to consider internal sources to a fracture network. And so they can be a stationary source uh, that is putting out acoustic or seismic waves, or it can be a moving source. Let's say we've got a source which is transporting along one of the fractures. And so as it's moving, it's illuminating different parts of the fracture network. And so we're going to use this as a way of, of saying something about the properties of the fractures away from the fracture that is actually containing the source. So to do that, we constructed a, a synthetic fracture test bed, and it's in acrylic. And what it is is it's a, a set of parallel fractures, and so this is highly idealized. But what we'll do is we'll drop a sonic or uh, acoustic source that uh, is very small, uh, but also has a very high repetition rate, uh, and it's going to fall naturally either under gravity or we're going to hold it at a fixed uh, position in this fracture F2. We have transducers. Here's an example of the transducers which are attached to the uh, receiving face. And so then we're going to look at how the acoustic waves are transmitted across these other fractures. In order to guarantee that we do have contact across these fractures, we have inserts. These were printed on a 3D printer. Uh, and it basically it, it has these, um, these raised discs, which when you have partial saturation will actually maintain a meniscus. And so there's going to be a meniscus coupling when it's partially saturated. And so this is a, an example of a, a photograph here where it's uh, uh, partially saturated, but then down here it's fully saturated. So here there is coupling because of the menisci that are held against each of these little discs. So we first do active transmission just to make sure that we understand what these fractures are doing and, and what their seismic signatures look like. And we can also change their saturation. And so here's an example of going from channel two through channel five. And we'll have a partially saturated set of fractures up here. Uh, whereas when we go from four to seven, in fact, they, they stay fully saturated. So you can see that the fully saturated signals all repeat very well. This is again for the active sources. Um, but then as you change saturation, of course, you'll get different uh, amounts of reverberation. I mean, there's, there's actually going to be codas and reverberations among these fractures. And then that's going to change as a function of the saturation. So we use what's called what we call chattering dust it's an uncontrolled source but what it is is it's a uh, it's a granule about a half millimeter in size in fact it's a set of granules about a half millimeter in size um, they're made of sucrose and they're filled with uh, pressurized carbon dioxide and so when you put them into water they slowly dissolve and then these these pressurized bubbles of carbon dioxide pop and so this is an x-ray tomogram and this is also an x-ray tomogram uh, we've looked at the uh, size distribution of these uh, bubbles that are of CO2 that are trapped. Uh, and it, it turns out that it, there's actually a rough correspondence with um, the, uh, the magnitude of the acoustic events and the size distribution. You can imagine that the larger the bubble, the more energy is actually uh, contained in that bubble. So the chattering dust, this is just a way of characterizing it. So we uh, used this uh, Death Star configuration where we dropped a chattering dust down the, uh, the center and it's falling under gravity. And then we look at uh, these pairs of, of uh, ultrasound transducers. And so that gives us a way of characterizing the, the chattering dust. It is an explosive source that has a, uh, a compression wave that's sent out and it is relatively isotropic. Uh, so it, we have uh, uniform signals in all directions. When we drop it down a fracture, this is looking at the, the transvert, or this is actually looking you know, along, or down the side of the fracture, and you can see that it, it localizes very well. But when you look transverse, uh, it jumps around quite a bit. And part of that is the, uh, these little explosions as the CO2 bubbles pop. Um, it actually makes it jump back and forth, and so we can also track uh, how this is jumping. And then th this is the set of transducers that we're using. So what we're going to do is use a Siamese neural network uh, to characterize the uncontrolled source. And so instead of using the active source, which is a very repeatable si uh, signal, the uncontrolled sources uh, have very highly varying signals. And so the amplitudes are changing, frequency content is changing. Also, there's no trigger, no direct trigger. 
uh, for these events. And so what we're going to do is use a, a, a Siamese neural network uh, to look for uh, differential signatures related to changes in saturation. So here I'm going to show an example of the Siamese neural net uh, classifying the MNIST data set. Now the MNIST data set, this is a, a standard data set in which, uh, in this case, it's the written numerals. And so what we do is we just tell the neural net whether the numerals are the same or different. We don't actually have to give them a separate class label. And so then what the neural net is going to do is it's going to separate these 10 different classes in the latent space, which will be down here. And so we'll take a look at this as we run it. And so what you're looking at is the latent space. This will be looping. Uh, there are 10 different colors there. And you can see that there are these little fuzzy balls. And so each fuzzy ball represents one of the numerals. And so it's, it's maximizing the difference between dissimilar classes and minimizing the difference, differences within uh, a class. And so that's really what the neural net, the, the fact that it is, it is a, a twin neural net, and it's always looking at pairs. And so it's trying to maximize the separation between dissimilar pairs and minimizing the distance between similar pairs. And so in this case, we see the full uh, separation of the, uh, of the numerals. And so then we get a nearly perfect classification of these handwritten numerals. So we're going to use this neural net. And what the way we, we use it is that we, uh, you always give a Siamese net, it's also known as a twin neural net, uh, you give it pairs. And so the pairs are either uh, from uh, similar conditions or dissimilar conditions. You don't actually need a, a specific class uh, index for it. You just have to tell the network whether it's the same or different. And so what we'll do is, is give it either two signals from saturated or two signals from unsaturated or one signal from saturated, one signal from unsaturated. And so then what it's trying to do is, is the dimensionality reduction uh, through a contrastive loss. Once we do the dimensionality reduction, in this case, we go down to three features. We then put that into a standard multi-class classifier. In Mat we use MATLAB, and so there's something called an error correcting output code, or ECOC. And so we train this afterwards. That's trained separately on the three-dimensional feature set. Uh, and then this actually shows you that we're looking at, at four different saturation conditions, and they do actually separate pretty nicely in this three-dimensional latent space. All right, so what we're doing is uh, looking at four different uh, saturation conditions. So fully saturated, uh, this is where we have partially saturated fracture three, partially saturated fracture five, and then partially saturated both fractures three and five, right? So this uh, the four different conditions. We're going to look at three case studies. And so it's going to be a stationary source with four classifications for the different uh, saturation conditions. Uh, and then another stationary source, but this will be a prospective data set. And so this will be where we completely cycle the saturation condition of the fracture and we train on an earlier set and then we predict a later set. Uh, and then the third case study will be for a moving source, which is falling under gravity. For the first case study, what we see is um, that there's a lot of variability. Right? So this, this is actually just a stack of all the different uh, individual events coming uh, for the three different uh, saturation conditions. And you can see that the uh, standard deviation is almost at 100%. The relative standard deviation is almost at 100% relative to the signal. And so that's part of the challenge of using these uncontrolled sources. Um, now, what we're going to key in on are the codas, the fact that as the seismic waves or acoustic waves are propagating, uh, that they will actually be reverberating, and there are these multiple bounce pathways that we can consider. And so we've got codas at the dashed red, dashed purple, black, and green. But you'll notice that the, the wave packet duration is actually longer than the separation of the codas. And so this is a case where the codas are not well resolved. And so this is now stacks of uh, our signals under the four conditions. So we call them saturated, S3, S5, S3, 5. This is a training set, validation set. And then this is the uh, training uh, classification and then the validation classification. And as you can see that we, we do actually get a fairly nice separation. Here is our confusion matrix. And you can see that the, the diagonal on the confusion matrix is much higher than all the off diagonals. So when we use a majority rule, so each event, we may not need to classify each single event. What we're doing is classifying a group of events and deciding whether that's uh, coming from one of these four different saturation conditions. And so in fact, we have a perfect classification when we use the ensemble of, of events uh, in order to classify the saturation of the fracture. Uh, we can look inside the neural net. Neural nets do suffer from the black box problem that 
typically one doesn't you know, lift the hood and look inside. Uh, we can do that, and so we can look at, at the neural weights. Uh, we do have an L1 regularization term that's part of our loss function, and so that does drop out the, the least important uh, signal channels. Um, we also did some downsampling, and what we see is that we do, when we cluster the weight correlations, we get roughly three groups. The middle group there is kind of weak, but we get about three groups. Um, and so that's kind of, that's, that's consistent with the fact that we are using a latent dimensionality of three. Um, then, now it turns out that even after we downsample, there are still correlations among the channels, and so we could probably either downsample more, or we could use a convolutional neural net. Uh, and then this is looking at the internal states on the first, second, and third layer of the neural net. And you can see by the, the third layer that we've, we see the emergence of a very clear signature difference among the three saturations. With the L1 regularization, we can go in and look at uh, the highest weights because a lot of the weights get downweighted with L1 regularization. And so these, this is just an example of the, the uh, main weights going into the first uh, layer of the neural network. And we can see that there's a little bit on that first arrival. But most of the weight is actually coming in this overlap region, which is really around... Now this is the arrival of the first coda. The coda actually uh, continues after that, right, because of the size of our wave packet. And so there's a range over which we've got the first coda and then the second coda. And so most of the neural weight is actually showing up uh, at the first and second codas. So that's carrying most of the information. So now we move to case study number two, and that's with a stationary source, again, but we're going to do a perspective four-class classifier. And so what that means is that we want to be able to train on one set of data for the four saturations, then completely change the sample, change all the saturations, and then take a, a completely new data set. And so we're going to train on the original training set and then predict on the prospective set. And so now in that case, we again get very good classification. So even after all the fractures have been completely uh, cycled in terms of their saturation, we take a, a completely new data set. Uh, we see that in here, in this case, the confusion matrix, uh, strong diagonal terms. You can see that there's very, uh, very low off diagonals. Uh, very now this is on an, a per event basis. And so some of these uh, events here are actually getting misclassified. But in fact, if you take the majority rule, uh, we have a very high, in fact, perfect classification on the saturation state of the fracture. Now, the final uh, uh, case study is with a moving source. Now, in this case, this is really where we're heading. We want these sources to move through the fracture network. So in this case, it's just simply that it's dropping under gravity. And so it is changing its, its location. Now, what happens is that because we pipette from the top, the partial saturations are actually changing as the source is actually dropping. And so we'll pick that up. And now we, we go to a two-class classifier. And so in this case, we have the saturated condition and then the uh, partially saturated condition when we syringe uh, uh, fracture five. Now this is the depth. You can see that these, these uh, sources are, are falling, okay? And so here it's also falling in the case of the partial saturation. Now you notice that there are some, uh, now th these are the classifications for partial saturation, but as it gets deeper, it actually starts to confuse it with the more saturated case. And that's exactly what you'd expect uh, with the menisci. So the menisci are actually getting uh, denser as you fall. And so we can use the uh, classification, which in this case is just binary, but then we can do a running average and we can see that we can construct a pseudo saturation where we have fully saturated in this case. And then in the partial saturation, it starts out with low saturation, but as the source gets deeper, uh, it's, it's looking at the stronger menisci, and in fact, you see that the saturation is actually coming up. And so in summary, the Siamese neural network, uh, we use uh, this shared weight, weight approach, uh, and it's very good for finding subtle differences uh, between waveforms. And that's actually what we needed because we're looking for subtle changes in the coda wave. And so that's really what it's doing is it's, it's finding that coda wave. Uh, and then this is just a initial step. Uh, what we hope to do in the future uh, is to introduce moving sources into uh, realistic fractures uh, and in rock. Thank you.